let's get started. I got my notepad in case I think of anything on the fly. But um, so largely what this is going to be is a rundown of marketing from a local perspective for the most part. But the concepts of marketing, somewhat universal, things are going to stay um, pretty applicable across all things. We're going to do 30 minutes of me talking about a lot, and I'll ask for questions if you guys have any. If you do have questions at a certain point, feel free to use the hand raise button, and I'll ask you what the question is. If I um, uh, think that it's best to answer in the Q&A session, we'll just take note of it, and then I'll answer it at the end, because um, some of these are bunny trails that can be rather deep. But uh, as we go through, jot it down, too. If you got any notes, this is the, this is the time to take notes. So. Let's get going. So this is the marketing guide for small businesses as of 2023. This is like marketing shifts. So, you know, in six months, maybe I'll have a different guide. I don't know. If I do, I'll do another presentation. Um, and so who am I? I'm Tyler Williams. I'm the owner of Mammoth Marketing. I started doing marketing about 20 years ago as a video producer, became creative director, started dabbling in all sorts of things. I bought this agency in 2015 and immediately started um, the digital transition because it was a print radio TV shop for the most part when I took over. And as, as I saw the future happening, when Steve, the previous owner left, I was like, okay, cool. We need to start doing digital and we need to get this figured out. Now I would very much say we are a digital first agency. Um, and throughout the year, we have about between package clients and like special projects, we end up with about 60 clients on our roster um, on any given year. And that that tends to like that's going up over the years. So uh, it used to be we were only in Fairbanks, Alaska, then it became we are only in Alaska. And now it's we are only in the United States, although I did a consult with someone in Canada. So we'll see if we start going international soon. Um, and those Canadians were very, very polite. Uh, I enjoy talking shop. So I'm gonna go fast. I talk a ton. So hang on and let's just go. Let's first talk about the marketing landscape and like what is going on. Because even though we're well into a digital ecosystem, the, the amount of changes that people have to deal with are still rather enormous. Um, and then they keep changing. And it's hard to be nimble, but businesses have to be at this point. Because if you truly want to capture attention, and I would argue that the attention span of the audience has gotten slimmer and slimmer and slimmer, you have to be ready to pivot in order to activate something new if it ends up moving. Big example of this is the rise of TikTok. And I know TikTok may not hold on. It was just banned in Montana. Um, but it's still an indication of why businesses need to be nimble. Like, so that way you can follow the audience. I was surprised when I realized how many middle-aged men were sitting on TikTok just going swipe, 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 swipe. But almost my entire like friend group was doing that. So, so the marketing landscape used to be pretty, pretty straightforward. It was like, all right, print radio, TV, we make some ads, we let them run for three to six months, maybe 10 years in the case of some of our, our, our clients. I made an ad that ran 10 years in the market for TV. Um, it was seasonal, so it got little bits of breaks, but it's gotten, quite a bit more complex. The um, the landscape, like I said, is always shifting, but the biggest difference now is every action you take in your business to reach people has a digital touch point. So you cannot ignore the digital and you have to do the digital before you do anything else. Because if you run a big old radio campaign and you don't have a good way to accept the traffic, um, then people will not find you. They do not memorize phone numbers. They do not memorize websites. They Google or they Bing search. And um, so you, what you need to do is make sure that you have all your foundational elements in place. Traditional media still works. If it didn't, it wouldn't exist. Platforms that don't work, they die because people stop buying them. It's just a matter of how much, and it's usually not the first thing that we recommend for people anymore because of the price per CPM or a thousand views or a thousand impressions. Uh, when you start working backwards with the math, those uh, can start to get pretty expensive. So we usually rely on digital and a mixture of pr platforms and then move into traditional 
after uh, we feel like we've saturated the market elsewhere. Measurement these days can be done almost anywhere, including on traditional in some ways, it's a little bit fuzzier there, but with um, measurement on digital, it's pretty solid. Like you get your impressions, you get your click-through rates, you're able to sort of see uh, and track all the way to conversion sometimes, um, most times. Uh, and what's great about it is you get that data. But the problem with data is it can confuse you. Data, it can be taken multiple ways. And so just like any statistic that you hear and see about on the internet, data is one of those things that you have to look at it, take it, and then realize what the actual behavioral patterns of the user are. It's all about psychology in the end. That's what marketing is. Now, the data can help you make informed decisions, but it's not the only factors that you need to take into play. There's a lot of gray area in marketing data. So the other thing about marketing is now, it's necessary. Like, it's not just now. I think marketing was always necessary, but people didn't call certain things marketing. Um, it's not a nice to have thing. And this is marketing in general. This is not advertising. This is just if you aren't thinking about how you are getting customers or customer acquisitions, then you are not going to grow your business. And everybody here pretty wants, they want to grow their business. They want to make it bigger. They want to make it more of what it needs to be. So, um, over time, as you start working with marketing, you learn more and more and more about what works for specifically your business and the industry you're in, the maturity of your company, the regional aspects of your, your business, and your customer list itself all can change the approach. We have had almost clone identical style of companies in two completely different states and seen something really just take off here but not take off here and a lot of it has to do with regional dialects cultural decisions made in that area as well as just population densities so you need to be thinking and learning about how your audience is working all the way across however the fundamentals of how you get that data ends up being really really similar well, let me go over here. The other thing is, I mean, one of the biggest things I see with marketing is people do it in fits and starts. They don't think about it consistently over time. They don't consistently start the month going, I'm going to do these things to try and get customers this month. Instead, they go, I feel like I want customers this month because last month was slow. So let me see what I can put into play in order to try and get customers. And then they get some customers. And they're like, OK, I'm good. And then they take their eye off the ball. And then they end up in another slump. And so it's this feast or famine. And that's why you need a system. The problem with systems, is this is all, I mean, this isn't even all the things you can activate for a business. This is a ton, there's a ton of ways. You, and the, the way that they're all integrated and interconnected is something to consider as well. Now, not every business needs to like bite off on all of these at all times. That would be far too expensive and complex. But there are definitely some where I go, you need this, this, and this, and every business needs it not just like a certain sector. So the in some of these, some people don't even know what they are. Like Google local service ads are popular in home services, but in other places, they, they're like, what are those? Because it's not available for their market. So then you've got these like specialized tailored places to advertise as well. So um, my, the last one is my favorite because if anybody isn't leveraging their personal network and your best personal network is always your parents, which is mom and dad, please like my post to give me more reach. Um, so my mom has a tendency to see my stuff on Facebook and like it all. And guess what? I get more people just like her seeing my stuff. She doesn't own a business. So whether or not that's useful is up in the air. But marketing is almost it, like marketing bleeds off into almost everything your business does from a customer acquisition to a service standpoint, and then to a follow-up standpoint and a repeat database activation standpoint, trying to get old customers to rebuy certain sectors of your service. Everything matters when it comes to it. every part of it needs to be funneled through the lens of marketing in some way shape or form there's only so far that like an agency can do it but you as a business owner or operator somebody working within the business need to think about well how would this approach work for our customers so um it really is an all-encompassing thing which is why it it's something i want to tell businesses to do all the time is Think of everything as marketing, from the way you roll up a driveway if you use service vans, or the way that you invoice a customer, 
or the way that you approach them when you talk to them for the first time, all of that's marketing. Um, and if you start hammering away all those little touch points for your customer, from before they walk in the door to the service to when they leave, you will find that your overall customer base will lift because your service goes up in quality, your business goes up in awareness, and more people are willing to trust you and refer you at the tail end. Okay, and here's something that I think a lot of people tend to underplay, is branding. Um, to me, good quality brand matters. It is absolutely worth every business going through a branding process at some point in their lifetime, usually somewhere within the first two to three, or one, from inception all the way to three years, is when you should be thinking about how can I amplify my business's um, visibility purely through the way that it approaches people. And branding is a big deep dive. I'm gonna do a, a, a sort of a, a lighthearted version of it here. But, and I slapped this mammoth on here because that's what I developed seven years ago was this weird Photoshop thing of a mammoth in a suit. I will tell you that people recognize it. It's a little bit creepy. Some find it disturbing, but hey, it's loud. And it ends up being this weird bat signal into the marketplace for my business, as well as my face. I am leaning further and further into me because I'm a human and I really do think that people connect with people and we'll get into that some more, like here. So the louder your brand is, the bolder it is, the more locked in it is, the better chance you have of making an impression inside of the marketplace for your business and to your customers. The, um, it's, it's all about the audience because if you are projecting out naturally, what your customer actually cares about, they're going to trust you much easier. And if you are projecting something that is a mismatch with the values of your customer, you are going to have a hard time getting segments of the market. And where I have seen this is in like home renovation and construction companies where they go and they spend all this money making a badass brand and they're trying to get the, um, the family mom to hire them and the two are a mismatch. They're positioning themselves like a custom car shop when they need somebody who just wants to invite them into their home and know that they're gonna get good service. The two don't mix very well. So you gotta think about how does your brand fit your audience? It's all about connection and building that trust and credibility before they ever call you. So branding itself is a landmark of psychology. Keep that in mind. And I happen to be a big fan of avatars. My mammoth is an avatar. And then AI made this avatar of me. And I slapped it on the slide because chances are the first thing that your eyes went to was the silly little cartoon version of me because it has eyeballs. There is a reason why dogs and babies look you in the eye. And you can leverage that with your marketing, whether it's a person on a video like me half the time, or it's an avatar like this. The other thing to remember is that hiding gets you nowhere. These are two brands in our market. I'll let you guess which one I'm responsible for. So the thing that I find being a problem is people go, I have a brand, I have a logo, and I have these things, and they slap it on whatever they have, whether it's a storefront, a van, their uh, advertising in general, and it does not stand out from the crowd. This is a good example small like half step measures with branding mean that you're hiding how many white panel vans do you see around our community a ton and so when we did prospector spoiler alert, we knew that we needed to stand out we went bold big loud that helped build the company in huge ways that we're still trying to quantify because the advantages are really all about psychology and they don't track in the same way. When you have a quality brand, you're breaking the ice with people before they ever need you. But when they need you, they remember you and you're part of community chatter. Your advertising is cheaper because they're going straight to you instead of going to the most competitive marketplace, which is Google search to find you. The other side of it is um, they will engage with your brand so you get more clicks by nature of people being aware of who you are 
and the kind of company you are when they see a list of companies. And because of all these things and the way your brand influences everything moving forward, your business can and will be bigger. It's a stair stepper. So that's most of brand. Now it comes down to, okay, but how do you market the thing? Like now you got a business, how do you take it and actively leverage it into the marketplace? And so what I did is I sat down and I was like, okay, here's sort of the ideal rollout that we use for our clients, all about the ads. So the biggest thing is remember the journey of the customer. They don't need you when you're advertising to them most of the time after a certain point. Otherwise, all you're doing is lead gen, we'll get into that. They don't need you. Then they go, I might need you, which is also called a consideration phase. There's awareness, consideration, conversion, and it all goes down into a funnel. Along these steps, as you advertise to people, you lose people, but that's okay. That's part of the process. You're gonna run ads to 100,000 people. You're not gonna get 100,000 customers, not immediately. So the I need you right now is where they actually give you money. Um, that is called conversion. That's the pinch point of the funnel. So people come in and you work them through this and then they give you money. And that's usually where most businesses stop. And that's also a mistake. You need to leverage them as, I should tell my friends about you. I would like to review you. You need to be asking for that after the sale. And a lot of companies aren't and it's hurting and we'll get into why in a while. So the first thing we do is we make sure that all the digital foundations are in place. You've got a business name, so I'm assuming all that's figured out. Um, and then, okay, maybe you've gone through a branding process. Well, what's next? Getting a URL. So that way you have a website. That URL should be simple. And the website should be tuned for conversion, which we'll get into in a second. Um, you should have an email that is not a Gmail, a Hotmail, or like a Yahoo. Please, if you have a URL, you have the ability to leverage that in your email and make you feel much more credible than the guy who's running around with a Gmail account. I um, see this all the time on companies of all sizes. It's very unprofessional. <laughs> and I think it gives the user a check. This goes back to sort of like branding and presentations. You wanna make sure that you have your business listings locked in and that you own them, no one else. We've had clients come to us who have their Google business listing at some previous agency and they can't get it back and they have to start over. And it's terrible um, because they might have 150 reviews on that old one with five-star rating and they have to build all that back up. Sometimes you can get Google to, to bring it on over, but it's often hard. Um, so get your Google business listing, that's primary, then a Bing business listing, and then you can start going into like Apple Maps and things like that. But those two primary search engine listings are massive because they will help Google and Bing really know where your website should rank in the grand scheme of things. It's a massive, uh, influx for them. And if you have multiple locations, you need to have a listing for every location. Don't try and do it all in one. It confuses the system, especially on Google's side. So you need to have one in, if you've got two, two different cities that you're serving, have one in each side. So that way you can leverage the review count goes right towards there because that's the community that interacts with it. And the review count goes over here and that's the community that interacts with it. There are some things that you can cross post and do some things together, but overall, they're separate locations. You almost have to treat them like separate businesses and they have separate markets. So to some degree, you need to leverage the fact that they are separate people. You're not gonna get somebody from city A into city B. So come to them like a local business would. Uh, social profiles, These, this is the short list of the things that we think that you should take on. Uh, Facebook business manager, so Facebook's a nightmare right now with all their layers and stuff. You should have a personal profile, then that should dip into your um, Facebook business manager. You go to business.facebook.com, get that, have it, and then build your Facebook page using the business manager. This will allow you to accept employees and vendors in and out of your business and you control it. And all the stuff you wanna control, you can let somebody set it up, but if they don't give you control, you don't own it. And the minute that something goes awry, you don't have the ability to jump in and fix it yourself or send somebody else to it. So all this, get your digital foundation in place, rock solid. There's probably a few things outside of this too that can be done. But now you need to think about, okay, I got all this stuff set up. 
but what about accepting traffic? Because ultimately, that's eventually you get to a point where marketing of any sort is going to start generating traffic. So whether that's you're shouting off on the street or you're running Google ads or you're running Facebook ads, what you're doing is you're generating traffic. So you want to make sure that you have your stuff tuned for that traffic and to accept it properly. And a lot of that comes down to conversion optimization is the fancy word for it, but it is letting the user know what you want to happen on the page above the scroll line. You should have a contact form. You should have a click to call button if you accept phone calls, and most people will want to do that. What we find in home services especially, most people use the click to calls, fewer people use the um, contact form. But make it easy for anybody to contact you in any way that they want, not in the way that you want to accept it. Your job is to accept the traffic. So contact form, phone numbers, call to actions as people go down your page, because the psychology of a page is they see the top first, whether it's a mobile or desktop, and then you're going to want to sit there and say, hey, are you ready yet? Are you ready to schedule your consultation? We do those. Click here. Are you ready to uh, get a free uh, widget? Click here. Those things you want to pepper down between each section, because each section that somebody flows down through your website is a credibility factor that you're trying to boost in order to finally get them to do the thing you want. Other thing is making sure that you have some form of a chat. Facebook has a good uh, Facebook Messenger widget that you can drop in for ease. It means you got to be using Facebook Messenger. Um, but there's a bunch of them out there. And we find that some people just would rather do that. They feel like, oh, I just want to chat. It doesn't mean you have to have somebody watching it 24 seven. But if you have that availability and that's the easiest way for people to feel comfortable contacting you, you get their phone number and their email, which means you can double back and you can send them a message automatically that says, hey, we'll get back to you as soon as we can. Somebody from the team will, will, will uh, contact you. Then you've got their data and then you can leverage that down the road. Um, mobile responsive, easy to navigate is a big thing. When you are looking at your website, you absolutely want to be going, can my user understand what they should do at this moment as you scroll down? Um, this is remedied a lot with like sticky headers that just stay at the top with a, like a call button or a contact us button of some sort. But also think about don't bury the actions under clicks. I was on a consult just the other day, and this guy was a, a plumber in Texas, and he had... Um, Basically, it was request service buttons. Those went to another platform that brought up all the like water heaters and water treatment systems that he was selling. Well, those had prices. And at that point, there was a tiny little phone number over on the left-hand column. I don't even know how it looked on mobile, but I was like, dude, why didn't you just have me call immediately? Like, your primary pillar is service work. Change that to just be a phone number that immediately goes to contact because then the user's doing what they want as well. They went to your website to get contact made. Like, you're a service company. They need your service. Don't bury it a click or two deeper. So put everything front page. When you're driving traffic to a page, make sure that they can go, boom, I'm getting it, and I'm getting it now. Um, so the other thing is your CRM. All of these contact forms, phone calls, they should all be tracked, number one. Number two, you should have a centralized CRM that collects it all. And then you should be able to export that and move it to anything that you want through like a CSV. And there's a bunch of them out there. MailChimp, Constant Contact, Jobber, Service Titan, High Level. And there's, there's a billion. House Call Pro. There's, there's so many. We use High Level because it's very adaptable to what we need for an agency. But it collects all this information. And I can see when somebody visited our website, when they scheduled the consult. I can send them text messages and emails directly out of it. I can... Well, that's how all this webinar stuff happened. It was all using high level. I can send out mass emails. I can filter people and tag them into specific emails. It allows me to tailor my marketing towards the audience that I'm trying to reach. So if you don't have a CRM, you need a CRM. I don't think it's optional for a business these days. A lot of people think that QuickBooks is a CRM, and I would disagree. That is a billing platform. So knowing all that, you can start putting campaigns in place. And here's kind of what we do. We start with lead generation. Lead generation, especially especially if it's a company like in need, where they're like, I need marketing to do something for me immediately. Lead generation is the closest thing that you have to a faucet, but I want to caution everybody. Lead generation still takes tuning and optimization. Lead generation is Google search, Bing search. 
You can do lead gen through offers as well, like direct response marketing, like, hey, sign up to get this offer or things like that. The problem with that is they might not be ready to actually use the offer yet. Whereas with search, it is high intent. So if you have um, like a water softener replacement, it's what somebody searches, you know that they are in market for water softener replacement. And they're gonna go, if you win that search click, you know that that's what they are there for. So it's really important that you also funnel them to a water softener replacement page. You don't just funnel them to a place where they can buy a water softener. That's not what they asked. They asked, how do I get this replaced? And that's different. So very high intent, and you gotta think about the transactional search terms that people are using with things like lead gen. Cool thing is though, Let's say they go to your page and you pay for that click. That click can be anywhere from like 16 bucks all the way up to 150 bucks. I've seen it run the gamut. Depends on the market and the competition in play. When it comes to getting into the page, you might not get that conversion. They might not actually give you contact, in which case you wanna follow them around. You know they are in market. So that's where retargeting comes in. If anybody has gone on Amazon and searched a product, I often use a mattress as an example, then suddenly you start seeing mattresses everywhere and the, 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 the conspiracy theorists of us think that their phones are listening, really, it's retargeting mostly. So the, what ends up happening is you search something, you went to a web page, that web page had a certain data signal, usually it's cookies, and then bam, you're showing up on YouTube, you're showing up on OTT, you're showing up all over these little boxes all across the internet, following the user around because they are the lemmings that you're trying to push off the cliff. So then you have, hey, still interested in that water softener system. Well, we're running a special. Get your water softener for, I don't know, 50 bucks off. Well, boom, you've pushed them over the edge. Now they're gonna click on your ad, go back to the page, finally fill out that form. That's the follow-up that you wanna do with the advertising if they don't convert. That form takes somebody to a thank you page, so then if they actually reach that page, you can take them out of your retargeting loop and say, nope, they meet all the criteria for staying out of my loop. People often run lead gen without retargeting, and then what ends up happening is they lose more leads because you just aren't, you aren't actively going like, hey, we're still here, would you like to know more? So uh, then when you have that loop there, and that takes anywhere from like 60 to 90 days to really optimize and get moving forward for you, then you start with brand awareness too. And brand awareness is back to the old days of advertising, interruption based. It is, hey, sit down, watch my ad. You don't want this, but I'm gonna put it here. So and we all have dealt with this, right? On Facebook, you got the box and you're like, oh God, get out of my way. On YouTube, oh, I can't wait until that skip button. And then on OTT, you're trapped. That's why it's 40 to 50 bucks per impression or per CPM is because you, unlike the old days of TV with OTT, you do not, um, you do not channel surf because you're gonna lose your spot in your streaming. So OTT is getting bigger and I'll explain it a little bit in a bit here because a lot of people aren't quite sure what it is. But when you leverage the brand awareness, you're building your company's uh, top of mind awareness and positioning inside of somebody. And so you got contacts who need you today, capitalizing on the traffic that you get from that high intent traffic. And then with brand awareness, you are manufacturing when their need becomes your opportunity, they come to you instead of going straight to Google or whoever else has done a better job at building their brand in the community than you. And when I say community, this could be local, this could be global, like it's just community, people who care and people who are paying attention. Again, lead gen campaigns, they're the modern day phone book, kind of already went over this. It's keyword based, your keywords need to be tuned in. We like to start it with a lot of guardrails and slowly release, which is why it takes time to build up these campaigns. Very easy to do wrong. We had a plumber join us who had tried to do his own and he was like, yeah, plumbing services and added a whole bunch of keywords and then started showing up for trash collection services and started getting calls for trash collection services. And he was like, I don't know what's happening. It's because his keywords were off. When we dove in, we were like, you left them too broad. You didn't put in guardrails. So now you started getting a whole bunch of stuff you didn't want. So the market is also really volatile because it is auction based, which means somebody else comes into the market and they're spending more than you, your costs go up if you want to get that same level of influence in that market. So if I want to run an ad around marketing and I want to pay $10 a click and somebody says, I want to pay $20 a click, they pay $11 a click. This is broad strokes as far as budget goes, $11 a click. Even as I go to like 12, they still go, well, we're 13 until I get to 
$21 a click. So they keep winning until I get up to here. And you're not always going to know exactly how much it takes to run that budget. You got to get the reports back from these platforms in order to do it. But that means you can see high swings in lead gen. And that leaves you open to vulnerability, which we'll get into in a little while. Retargeting campaigns to the right kind, kind of creepy. You're going to follow the users around the internet. I've already kind of, I feel like I've covered this pretty well. But use them to loop them back in. Use offers. Entice them to come back to you. There is a time where you can just use them as brand awareness, um, but it's, it is often best when you are doing both and leveraging people through like bringing them back in. Give them a reason to re-click on you, which means you got to tell them something new. And then brand awareness campaigns, all about building brain space. Um, Google Display, those are the boxes that follow you across the internet. You got YouTube. Social media is almost all brand awareness. Nobody, well, TikTok is the one exception right now where very few people go to social media and they go, hmm, uh, yeah, um, I don't know, doctor near me. They don't do that. And so you want to make sure that you are meeting the audience where they're at. Thing about brand awareness is you got to give them something that's interesting enough to be sticky. And that can be very, very tricky. And this is where most traditional media sits. So radio, TV, you don't really get much in the way of stats. They have these programs that'll like measure website impressions and things like that. I don't think those things work because usually when you do a traditional media buy, you're also doing a digital buy. And so you're just going to see a swing regardless. And there's no way to parse out the data very well. And all this changes over time. You start out heavy on lead gen if you need to make cash come in. And then your brand awareness, you don't ignore it. You slowly start stepping it up. So as the cash comes in, you should have a marketing budget that grows with your business. And then you start building your brand awareness more, and then you could start taking your lead generation down because it's the most expensive way to get people, customers. But you may never be able to drop it completely off. It really depends on what kind of business you are. The uh, biggest swing I've seen is a business save 50% of their budget by making that shift. They were extremely expensive, about $30,000 a month in lead generation in one market. And then they switched over to brand awareness and were able to throttle this down and saw no drop in business. And those are sometimes scary things to try, but they are worth it if you want to try and get your business working where it goes. Because expensive, you, you're not always going to have the budget to pay for it. Sometimes the, if you want to be top dog in your market, you may end up um, chasing a price that is unsustainable for your business, depending on what your market is willing to serve. And so I've seen two businesses fight it out like crazy. And then they just end up with no margin at the end of the day. But one does prevail at the end. So there's a lot to that. Awareness is the big long game of business. Like it's the thing that you do to win 10 years down the line and not today. Lead generation is the today factor. Targeting options. This is why you need a CRM. You can export your customer list. You can upload it right into these platforms and say, find me more people just like this, which is a great way to take this big, massive world of Facebook and Google and all these people on all these phones and narrow it down to the people who actually matter to your business. But the, the one thing that you need for this is a customer list. So it's called lookalike on Facebook. And there's a number of different ways you can build a lookalike audience. And it's called a customer match on Google. Google used to require you to have like, $10,000 in spend before you could leverage it. Now they've opened it up, I think, after 1000 bucks or something like that. They've, they've made it much easier. Um, and so you can start building your audience quicker um, and really leveraging the list that somebody already has. Now, we find that if a, customer, if a business has been in business for beyond two years, their list is plenty big for us to start working these things in, and we can test it. Be like, okay, well, here's your list of customers. Let's run it in the same geography, and let's try and find more people who match the profile signals of these people. Geofencing is also really cool. Um, it is highly targeted by location. Uh, you can also do it by weather, which is weird. We, haven't, we don't usually do that. Um, but if you have a trade show, if you have a, like most communities will have a trade show for a home show, you can say, all right, well, um, I'm going to fence in that trade show. Anybody who enters that trade show boundary, I'm going to retarget them and follow them around over time. 
and that builds your brand and it's cheap because you're taking a market that's this big and you're only advertising to these people. So these things are good to have in play almost all the time. So you can start building your list around trade shows, industry events, competition. And co what's fun about the competition is if you are a retail space, of course, if they enter your space and you, you follow them around, um, then they know, ooh, th these guys might have what I need at a different price point or a different version or maybe more inventory. But it's also really cool with recruiting. So we have leveraged geofencing to target plumbing companies in order to try and find plumbers who are tired of working where they're working and to go to the our client. Um, and it's a recruitment play at that point. The other thing you can do is adjacent businesses. So we have or had a client who was uh, did like home repairs, like patching holes in walls. Well, we could geofence his business into adjacent businesses like realtors, like electricians. And so we're not building it up with the customer. We're building it up with adjacent businesses that serve the same customer. Those kinds of partnerships work really well. The other thing you can do, get a little, a little weird in back alley here, is if you have a really good relationship with another business, you, they can give you access to their page on Facebook and you can leverage their audience as a retargeting metric as well. Maybe they'll ask you for some sort of kickback or you guys can share lists, who knows. Now, think of your privacy policy, think of like doing all this above board if there's some reason you shouldn't. Like HIPAA for medical offices is a thing. You don't wanna like poke the HIPAA bear. There's fines, big ones. Last thing is community. Like so many people ignore their community. Like it's, it, it, this is something that I have a hard time with. Um, we are a marketing agency. We can only take things so far. Uh, we can help support these efforts, but we cannot do them ourselves. And if anybody has a brick and mortar business, they can run a first Friday, like a little art show. Make a reason for people to come into your business. Leverage the community trade shows. We already talked about that, but get a booth. The minute your business is a physical entity instead of a digital platform or an advertising platform, you are so much more real to them. So leverage that and make that part of who you are. It, you may not get leads that make sense financially out of it, but that's not the true play. The true play is the long game. They see you there two years in a row at a trade show, you're going to start building awareness in a way that you don't anywhere else. Join the Chamber of Commerce. Like, be part of that community. You'll find that there's a lot of referrals that happen within those communities. And then you can start building those business partnerships with adjacent businesses. Um, and another thing is, I love this one because no one does it. If you are a home service company, find a neighborhood that you want to make traction in, host a get together for the community, for the neighborhood. Send out mailers or door hangers on those residential houses. I've got to think of mail laws here, but um, and say run a Facebook event and invite them to a, a nearby park within the community and say, hey, we want to serve hot dogs and hamburgers for you guys. And while you're here, we'll give you a coupon for fifty dollars off your first service at our company. Bam! Now they have a reason to hold on to the coupon, put it on the refrigerator. They're seeing you every day when they get their milk in the morning. These are things that people don't do enough of. And it's it's all really like tiny minutia things. And it can feel like a lot of manpower and a lot to put on. But these are what makes the difference between a company that just exists in the marketplace and a company that rules the marketplace. So also, they do cost money. But guess what? So does advertising. And the money might not be the cost of ads to get this thing out. That should be pretty cheap if it's a small enough service area. but the manpower. See how much your manpower will buy you in advertising? This will probably do more for you, to be honest. Last thing here is follow-up, like making your customers your fans. And I already talked about this a little bit. Monthly newsletters. Like, think of ways to engineer contact to your existing customers that matter to them. So special offers, referral programs, thank you cards, monthly newsletters. If you have any sort of like recurring services that you can offer. So if somebody bought, um, or let's say you did like a boiler replacement um, in November of last year, well then you should be emailing them in like September of this year, hey, you might need an annual tune. 
why don't you have us come on in and we'll take a look and see if you and and give you a cleaning and get you ready for the, the next season right so these things these maintenance things what they often end up doing is they lead to more work that needs to be done and even if no one takes you up on that email offer which is super cheap to spend to send even if no one takes you up on that offer you're still top of mind awareness because you even offered in the first place and nobody else is doing that to them so this is all part of the curation of your customer database and it builds customers into the process as you go it's called database reactivation so last thing is ask for reviews all the time don't gate it because if google catches you gating it they're going to ban you from their platform and then you lose a ton of business which means like i uh, will only send them to the review platform if they say that they like me don't do that just say hey you bought this thing from us please leave us a review if you get a bad review which is what people are terrified of if you get a bad review you need to decide whether or not it's legit and if it is because some of them will be you need to deal with that customer and if it's a cons and if it's a recurring legit offense that you see across the board then you don't have a marketing problem you don't have a customer problem you've got a service problem and you need to dive into your services and see how you can make it better for your customers the other side of it is if you get the scatter shot of like one bad review well, there's two, two things that happen here. One, it tanks your score if you have a few reviews. If you have a lot of good reviews above 100, one review is not going to suddenly jot you way down in the star ranking because that's all you are is a star ranking sometimes when people are comparing companies. What it's going to end up doing is it also gives you an opportunity. You respond and you say, hey, um, we don't want anybody to have this impression of our business. Please call the office so we can discuss like what went wrong and we want to make it right for you. What you have just done is you have signaled to that person that, okay, cool, they might get their problem fixed. But you've also signaled to everyone else who is looking at your reviews that they have a support line if they're gonna use your company. And that is something that people just aren't thinking about when it comes to the impression that they're leaving on the internet. So I highly recommend you get active with that kind of communication. Um, and you've moved the conversation offline. So if it truly is a big problem, this customer is just uh, like, you can't make them happy. Well, at least you tried and nobody else sees that you never made them happy. They see that you gave them support. So uh, don't ignore your reviews. And you should also be going for them from an SEO standpoint. Google looks at the flow of reviews more than they look at the star rating. The star rating, Google's like, whatever, that's just what the service is. They wanna know that you're an active business. They wanna know that the businesses that they are ranking well are getting regular business because that means they are active. So if you don't have a way to automate your review process, you need to find one or you need to schedule it as a regular thing where you're pulling your emails of customers who have cleared your business over the past 30 days, let's say, and you're sending them a review being like, hey, you used our business last month and really wanna know how we did. It's that simple. And then you send them the review link. You can pick up those review links directly into Google. And I, I prioritize one service for your reviews, Google first. Some people do Facebook and I'm like, no, no, no. Nobody goes to Facebook and like looks at all the reviews and recommendations. It's mainly happening on Google. Okay, paid versus unpaid. This is something I threw in kind of last minute because I have seen people feel like paid doesn't do enough and unpaid does a ton but nothing is free because you have the manpower equation. If you're trying to leverage unpaid traffic into the marketplace, you have to do so much more in volume and most people don't think of how much manpower that's gonna take. So this is, sorry if you hear the, the hammering going on below me. Um, this is posts on social media, regular content going out, email marketing, flyers, knocking on doors, this is all the boots on the ground stuff. It, it takes time, and if you're a business that's early in their flow, then yeah, maybe you can leverage your time for this, but eventually you're gonna get busy enough to where you have to pay to make contact, and that is the cool thing about advertising. Best thing I like about advertising is I don't have to call somebody at 8 p.m. to say, hi, here's my business. My ads do that for me. I get to go home and have dinner with my family, and yet my business is still talking out into the marketplace. So um, you can put ads on just about everything. There's a lot of different ways to leverage them, but the costs range. If you're going digital, and, and most traditional too, follows the similar metrics, 
you're going to pay anywhere from two dollars for a thousand views all the way up to 40. and the disparity of price is due to the power of the platform right and how many people are on it it's a supply and demand market so ott video very hard to deliver takes a lot of data server costs are more that's where you get 40 to 50 actually um per cpm something like facebook and google we've seen two dollars per thousand views but you know those are kind of those are much more fleeting than something like ott as well the impression is not quite as strong so you need more of them and that's why you want to reach somebody and on average 14 to 21 times so you what you do is you take your impressions that's how many served ads you have and you look at your reach your reach of how many unique users and you want to see how many times are we reaching the market and so it used to be back in radio days five to seven times is how many times you try and reach the market i will tell you that gets hard these days radio is starting to feel more and more expensive with digital it's still expensive like I, the very minimum i want to see a business who's doing a consistent brand awareness play reach their audience four times a month at the bare minimum most of the time i want to see eight or higher um and the only way once you get your market dialed in to control those um, metrics is by either shrinking your geography into the higher dollar customers. So like maybe a very affluent neighborhood that you want to make traction in uh, because they're willing to pay more for your services. And then you can grow into another one, another one. So you can do this like uh, neighborhood hop to some degree. So you either scale down your geography or you add more budget. That's how you get more frequency. It's that simple. Um, so you have to consider your market size. We live in a 90,000 person borough here. And typically what I want to reach for most businesses that are broad based in town is 30,000 minimum. I know there are also 35 or 30,000 homes in the borough. So that gives us a good cross section as well. So depending on what, who you are trying to reach, your overall market viability will shrink or grow um, because some people have a lot of different types of customers. Some people have one type of customer and always look for who's going to make the biggest impact to your business first and go after them first. Okay. Goals and measuring progress. The thing about advertising that people don't do is they don't measure and then they have no way to set their own expectations over what they can do with their advertising. And then they're just throwing money to the wind, just being like, well, it'll help. And it does, it usually does help. The business that is advertising always prevails over the one that isn't. Um, however, uh, if you really wanna get down to it, you can run ads and you can figure out, well, how much is it costing me to get a customer? And then you can reverse engineer your advertising spend. So this is especially for people who need service calls and things like that, phone, phone calls and form fills. Um, but you can even apply it to brick and mortar and you can even apply it to e-commerce. You kind of go things by transaction or conversion. So what revenue do you want in the business? That's the first place to start. How much money do you want to make in order to have the business that you need to have in order to sustain it and pay your crews and offer good product, offer good service? And then how much is your average ticket or sale? And then um, how many of those do you need to close in order to make your revenue? Then how many leads do you actually convert? So if you draw 100 people out of the market with contact and you're converting 10 of them, that's a 10% conversion rate. Conversion rates will vary. The better and more finely tuned your advertising is, the higher your conversion rate's gonna go up. But there is a limit. You're always gonna get some fall off. So after you start running ads, you can start to see these and feel these and understand, well, on average, we're doing this. And it'll do this. You will have good months, bad months, You'll have times where your advertising is rocking and times where your advertising feels like it's not doing enough for you. But over the long play of a season or a year, you start getting a really good idea of, well, currently the cost per lead is this. Okay, how many leads do you need now that you know how many of them you convert to reach your desired revenue? And then you can start building out your marketing spends in order to figure it out. And you can break this down per platform too. And there's a lot of minutia in all of how you run ads to a marketplace. Biggest thing that people don't think about with this is the lifetime value of the customer. For me, 
if I spend a thousand dollars in a month and I get, well, actually if I spend $3,000 in a month and I get one customer by the end of the month, I'm fine with it because our average price is going to be about $3,000 a month. So, okay. That's a, like, Oh no, I just, I just spent the entire month's revenue on getting that customer, but I'm going to have that customer three to five years. Then it starts making sense. And then you're building your snowball of business as well. And now, granted, some businesses need cash now, but you don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater by not taking care of your customers that you get, even if it doesn't make, make you money that day. And so if you have, and this is where the recurring services come in, this is where if you touch a customer multiple times over a course of years, figure out, well, on average, we make this much off of each customer every year. So if we do that, we want to pull in this many in order to get to this revenue. It's all a math equation. Now, where it gets gray and weird and fuzzy is when you end up getting into like um, a brand awareness, how many people are coming in organically and things like that. But it at least gives you a roadmap and a guideline. So what I've done is this. Uh, I put together a cost calculator. Um, this mainly is for lead generation and for people who are currently running ads. This is this pulls in some of the math of how we factor in marketing costs, um, but it gives you access to a spreadsheet, and that spreadsheet you can pop in um, all your numbers, and then you should absolutely revise those numbers over time. Your numbers today aren't going to be your numbers tomorrow, and that's okay. You have to figure it out. And this is where a lot of people don't put the time in. And so they never figure out what their business is, is doing. And so I got tired of hearing that and I put together this sheet. <laughs> so um, I highly recommend that everybody downloads this, not only because you're going to uh, get my retargeting most likely, but also because it helps. It helps you understand like, OK, how far can this can I take this? What can I spend? today and what will I make tomorrow? It gives you a little bit of a roadmap. Do the, does it always pan out well or along the lines of the math laid out here? No, but the, clo the longer you go and the more you finally tune everything, the closer this gets to it. Biggest thing, and I think this is the last point, maybe, is engineer your future. Figure out where, where the business is going and I'll give you one story as, a, as an ending note. Um, we took on a client who had built their business completely by word of mouth. And and before we took them on, I had a consult with them. And they said, man, we've been in business for 50 years. We, uh, uh, like our customers love us. We command our sector of the market here, our service area, and we're the cheapest in the market. Okay. So I was like, all right, what do you want to do? I said, well, we want to break into this market over here, which is just another neighborhood, just down the road. It's well within our service area. It's not going to cost us any more to do it with the crew that we have. But we need to make some, some roads in there, and we don't know how to do it without advertising, so that's why I'm on this console. I said, okay, great. Let me go look up. This is a plumbing company. Let me go look up how much it costs per click in that area. I said, how much is your average job? And they're like, oh, our average job is about, for service work, about 150 bucks. I was like, okay, well, that seems low, but let me go and take a look. And they charge by hour. And so I went and pulled it up, and their cost per click on their top dollar services was $50, which means that with three clicks, they have spent their budget on that service. And so a conversion rate needs to apply after that. You're going to bring in three clicks. Are you going to convert any of those? It might take 10. And so what they had done is they had built their entire business without thinking about marketing and how it works and how to budget for it. And that meant that they did not have the ability to go outside of their word of mouth market. So word of mouth grows and it stalls. Advertising builds you out in other places until it all becomes a bigger web. So what they have had to do is they had to go back and reevaluate their entire business model because for 50 years they had been working purely on one metric and when they wanted to do something new and they wanted to be bigger and better and offer better things to their employees and serve the customers better and do different kinds of work that would help their community, they couldn't do it because they never figured out what their marketing costs were gonna be in order to actually capture the customer. 
And guess what? They were super proud of how cheap they were. But marketing, if you aren't planning for it, if you aren't analyzing it, marketing uh, is something that you that should be built into the operational costs of your business from the outset. And then you should be revising what that is. And so what we often tell people is make marketing a percentage of every dollar that comes in. So you always have a way to leverage your marketing into a marketplace. If you aren't doing that, you're always going to kind of go, well, I think I have money today. And that's not how you sustain a business. Every business needs to look for customers and nurture the ones they have. Some of that's going to cost money. Some of it's going to cost energy, time, and manpower. So it's a matter of figuring it out. I do one-on-one -on -one consults um, pretty much for any business at least once um, in order to sort of talk about their business and sit down and go, OK, cool. Let's see where you're at. Let's think about how you can get there. Of course, this is my lead generation system, right? So. The point of these for me is to first give people useful information about how their business is looking. And then second, if it's a good fit, talk about services. So at the very least, people who come into this, they walk away with an idea of things that they can implement and things that they can do in their business today, tomorrow, in order to start making traction. And that's my, that's my, that's my pitch on consults.